Gadget! People think it's a bass line, this shit. But this is not a bass line, this is actually the horns over processed. Sup guys, this is Apache and welcome to my studio. So I'm in quarantine in Montreal, Canada right now. I was releasing my album that was already done when the quarantine started. So I had a lot of stuff to do regarding the, the release of the album and uh, all the promo and then uh, a bunch of interviews. Um, so for the first part of the quarantine, I was quite busy uh, with that release. And then, um, and then I did a few streams, live streams where I played and um, and uh, I feel like the last two weeks I took some days off and I didn't do anything. And um, except from protesting for the Black Lives Matter and um, watching some TV shows, uh, that's pretty much it. That was my quarantine. So I don't know exactly how many concerts uh, were canceled. Uh, but pretty much everything was cancelled, um, all the festivals, all the shows, um, just in one week, everything started shutting down and um, I, don't, I don't know in numbers exactly how many, but um, this year I had the best festival year ever and I'm kind of bummed it got cancelled, but at the same time, I guess it's it's life and it's the same thing for everyone. So. I just hope I'm gonna be booked for like next year or for other shows because um, I can't wait to get back on the road and start playing shows again. So how did I move from Belgium to Canada? I took a plane and I landed in Canada when I was 19. Um, originally because my, my mom was living in Canada already and uh, I wanted to get the fuck out of Belgium so I I was curious to see what Canada how Canada was and then um, I came here in the summer I started studying here and I loved it so I stayed here sup guys this is Apache and welcome to my studio um, it's uh, it's small, but it's very effective, and we have a great acoustic. This is the first uh, studio I ever built, uh, and it took years to get here. Um, and uh, I've pretty much um, started working in this studio when I did the Requiem EP, and then I did the entire um, uh, album Renaissance here. Um, and before that, I used to just work at home. Uh, let me give you a little tour of all the, the toys I have here. So here you got uh, Electribes, the MX and SX. So these are pretty much just toys. Uh, these were the first machines I bought when I was a kid. Like I, I was about 13, 14 when I bought the first one, the blue one. And um, I was making back then more like hard tech kind of music with our computers. And I was only making music with these like uh, machines. I don't use them that much today as the sound quality is not very good. But the, these machines have a very uh, sentimental value for me uh, as these were the first machines I bought. And it's still very fun to play with those. Uh, same with the, the Axis Verus C here. Uh, it's a digital synthesizer. Um, I used to use it a lot when I was younger and I use it a bit less now because you have plugins that are just much better in my honest opinion. But I like to have it around and I still have some really cool patches in there that I might use one day. Uh, here I got a... Um, uh, an acid like a, a TB three hundred three by Roland. This is a this is a machine from the eighties and uh, it's not even plugged right now. I'm I'm not gonna use it as the plugins sound even better now than the machine. But this is a pretty collector machine that I got from a Godfather, so it's like a collection piece rather than a tool for me to make music. Um, you got my pairs of Focal speakers, um, and these are the first major speakers I ever bought. Uh, pretty recently, they were only like two years old, and um, it's a total game changer for me. Uh, working with these speakers really changed uh, the 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 quality of my music. 
Um, I used to produce on these ones before. These are like small Newman's uh, KH 120. Um, then you got just a push. Always nice to play with a push for like some drum padding. Uh, when you work in Ableton, it's it's a cool flow. Uh, then you have a computer. It's it's basically just a, a, a iMac. It's a pretty old one now, but uh, it works great. Um, got like 30 gigs of RAM, which is just what I need for contact instruments because I use a lot of contract libraries and um, except from that I don't even know what the processor is and the other specs of that computer right now I, I remember just trying to buy the best that was available back then but it's uh, it's probably not much today um, on the other side this is more important though you got um, my interface setup is two Apollos, like one twin and um, one X8, which is basically they have processors as well that helps um, processing the plugins uh, from UAD so that the computer doesn't process the plugins, but it's actually th uh, those interface that process all these plugins. So it helps with your CPU. And uh, the great thing about these is you have great um, preamps so when you record like voice of whatever input you're going to put into it the 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 pre uh, the preamps are going to be much better than like smaller type of interface as well as you can choose the um, uh it emulates you have plugins in there that emulates cool preamps um if you want to give it like um like a nevy old kind of color to the sound of your preamp these machines give it to you um here I got another thing I got from my godfather, which is a Juno 60. It's another old synthesizer back from the 80s. Um, it's really, really crappy sounding, very warm. I love it. And then uh, the last thing I got from my godfather is an actual 808 uh, as well, bought in the 80s from my godfather. And now I have it. It's a bit broken and it doesn't work very well anymore. I have to repair it. But at this point, it's more of a collection piece than an actual synth I would use. I'm just so glad I have an actual 808 and I got it pretty much for free. Um, and then last one is just uh, my, MIDI, my MIDI keyboard um, with 808, um, 88 keys. And, um, and I think that's it for the studio. Um, yeah. Because the, the bass line or the horns that actually have uh, a bass line in it, this... Uh, so this riff has a sub. And um, so because I have a sub doing the riff and I have um, a 808, which is obviously conflicting because it's two, um, two sub sources playing at the same time, what I had to do uh, uh, which is something that I still do a lot today. I just don't use. Um, I, I I just don't do it the same way. Is um, uh, a sidechain frequency separation, which is basically uh, just you do a rack, and in one rack you let the medium and the high pass um, sidechain just the sub frequency. So when you have that entire riff playing, you the the kick is sidechaining only the sub part, um, which is essentially this side chaining into this uh, so that they leave each other a bit more room so they can play at the same time because obviously if you don't have that it's just gonna sound like like crazy shit um, so yeah this is how I used to process my stuff which is pretty straightforward and basic but it seemed to work In 2012, 2013, we used to pay someone to do my mastering. So I wasn't doing this mastering myself. So right now on my master, in contrary to this Max Course remix where I showed exactly what I did on my master, uh, here I do have nothing. Uh, you can see the, the levels are quite low. It's just, um, it's just no compression on the master. Everything is just well mixed in the mix down, but the master has nothing. I see there is an ozone here, but I don't think it's doing anything really. Um, 
oh wait there is actually some stuff on the master but it's not applied it's probably what i used to do back then and i still use ozone 5 today but just not in the same way and there is just a bit of um there is seems to be some maximizer um as a limiting tool a bit of stereo imager and the multiband compressor that's it uh however that's not something i actually ended up using in the master that you have probably heard so um that's it uh, so my computer crashed and um, I have to uh, restart a computer um, and I hope I didn't lose the screenshot and um, Showbiz baby. Yeah, that's it. That's um, That's my life <laughs> at dealing with this computer All right, so for the trumpets uh, which are actually horns uh, French horns um what did I do? So um, I don't remember, but let's uh, find out. I'm gonna unfreeze these channels. Hopefully they still play. Um, mainly it's a group uh, composed of a sub. And um, this sub is actually just massive. If I unfreeze the, the song, I lose the preset and then it sounds bad, so I'm not gonna unfreeze it. But basically, it's just like a like a warp a bit, a bit like when you would uh, use A in FM into B with two sine waves um, in uh, like lower octaves as a like just a normal sub. Um, there is some saturation, uh, some weird hectic EQ, some overdrive, and that's pretty much it. And then on the horns, I think the horns are a bit more hectic and this I can unfreeze, but it's basically a contact instrument. Whoop. Uh, with some saturation, another weird, weird ass fucking EQ. So they're overdriving two different parts of the, the harmonics, uh, a compressor and then another EQ. And together they're actually going into this bus where there is a lot of compression happening and a multiband compressor. And that's pretty much it, guys. It's all about balance. Um, yeah, have fun if you want to copy it now. Um, I can see you. I'm watching you. If you copy me now. Got my eyes on you. I wanted to do this song first um, with like uh, this Russian melody and um, I, I wanted obviously some some rap on it and uh, um, I was searching for a girl that could rap in Russian and in English and I like aggressive rap um, and there's not a lot of like aggressive female rappers that can just like you know go hard on any kind of beats um, I remember asking my friends in Russia if they knew anyone, um, any rapper that could do the, the job. And um, honestly, like, kind of felt like no one was really good. Like, I, I, I heard a, a few things, but it was just not good, um, to me at least. And then uh, my friend uh, sent over this girl and she said, she's more of an influencer, uh, a funny girl, and she, She's a bit controversial, but she dropped an album and um, my friend liked the album. So I, I took a, a listen and um, I couldn't understand anything, but the flow was there. She could rap the, the way I wanted. She was like screaming, rapping. It's, it was pretty much what I liked. So I sent over a message and three days later, I received the, the vocals back and, uh, and, and everything went just so quickly. The week after, we were ready to shoot a music video. I don't know for how long I knew that melody, but I feel like it's, it's the kind of melody that everyone kind of heard it at some point in their lives. Um, I can't remember exactly when, but I do um, remember the Tchaikovsky's version uh, that I liked a lot. and. Uh, other really famous um, songs from Russia, I, 
I mean, I'm, I love classical music and, and Russia has so many composers, uh, Igor Stravinsky, Prokofiev, Ch Tchaikovsky. Uh, they've all songs that are worldwide famous um, and they're from a long time ago. So I guess, yeah, I know a bunch of these melodies from Russian classical composers. I mean, I sure do know um, a few, uh, but from the ones that I love personally, um, I love my friend Proxy, I love Volak, I love I Speak, um, I love Max Korsch, um, then I know Basta, I know uh, oh, the Teddy Killers was sick too, um, uh, and Kipala. I mean, I don't listen to a lot of dance music anymore, but um, in the drum and bass scene, there's a bunch of guys that I love, um, like Noisia. Every release is still very impressive for me, um, as well as like the Matthews, uh, Imanu, and all these guys still pushes the boundaries of uh, music productions uh, in dance music, which I admire. On a different side, uh, I love the people that are mixing more indie and pop stuff with dance music, but in a really edgy way, such as uh, Josh Ban, XNG, and um, and lately I've been listening to a lot of Labyrinth, and I know he's more of a singer and a pop artist, but the the people that produce for him, and I think he produces as well, it's it's like almost trap, but it's so tasty, and like each sound is so well placed, I love it. I think they have really crazy music videos and uh, I love their music videos. Maybe on the, the music side, it's, I mean, it's, it's a bit more of a joke to me. Um, I was like, I don't think it's um, like, it's, it's not the kind of music I would listen to, but uh, I think it's really entertaining and I love what they have created uh, around this band and, and especially vi visually, I love it. When I was nine, ten, uh, my sister installed uh, Fruity Loops, like I think it was the three point something on uh, my dad's computer uh, because my sister wanted to make, uh, I don't know, I think at that time like hard techno or something like that. Um, and I just remember opening it, opening that program uh, and just or just like looking at what my sister was trying to do. Um, and I just realized in Fruity Loops it was pretty easy. You had these like grids, and you click on the grids, and then you press play, and it and it plays whatever you click on the grid. It's like a like a block Tetris kind of thing. It's really easy as a kid. I remember as a kid um, doing just like just like super easy beats. Uh, but it's only later on when I was like. Uh, I don't know, like 13, 14, that I realized that another program that my dad was using, uh, Cubase, was actually on the computer as well. And uh, and that was actually rather used, uh, well, he was using it to record instruments, like real instruments, because he, he used to record himself. Uh, it was actually quite similar to Fruity Loops. You could, in Cubase, put some beats and stuff like that. And around that time, I, I learned to use Reason, and I was using Reason in Rewire. That's like a, something that used to exist. I'm not even sure if it still exists, but it's something to connect two programs, and it's called Rewire. And I was uh, rewiring Reason into Cubase, uh, and that's how I started more seriously. And then over the time, I switched to Mac, and then I couldn't find a cracked version of Cubase, so I, I, I cracked Logic on my Mac. And then I produced on Reason and Logic, again in rewiring for a bit. And then I wanted to play live, and I had these like uh, these machines right there. Um, and with those machines, um, to connect it all together in live, um, Ableton Live uh, was just better vertically to like play like more live stuff instead of producing. So that's how I got into Ableton Live. And I have been on Ableton Live since then. Just some sound design work and some recording in Pro Tools, but I'm still mainly working in Ableton. Well, first I released this album with five singles, so it gave us some 
um, some individual power for each release, uh, or at least like half of the album almost was like separate singles, uh, which really helps for like promotion and stuff like that. If you c compare it to like what most people are doing in the EDM world, um, but I think. Uh, if you really compare my album um, with different artists that are from the EDM scene, um, people s s like want to make bangers, uh, just like big songs that will be played by every DJ and it's going to be played, um, I don't know, for like two, three months by every DJ. Well, like what I tried to do was make a, a whole piece mixed um, with a lot of different kind of music. Um, but generally mixed with classical music and I wanted this album to have a beginning and an end and kind of let the listener go through an adventure while they listen to the full album and and it's not an album where you can take out the songs individually and uh, and really listen to them individually I feel like they're all connected in some ways um, or at least that was that's that was what I tried to do and um, it's very important for me to not be associated with that culture of just like trying to make a banger that is going to die after six months. Well, first, because it was one of my all-time goal as a musician. Um, I love classical music and I love mixing it with hip-hop and electronic. Um, so it kind of made sense for me to, at some point in my life, be able to record a full orchestra instead of just using plugins that emulate like a robotic kind of um, orchestral feel. It's, um, yeah, uh, besides from just being a goal, it's like on an artistic view, it's, it just gives something that a computer will never give you. And uh, and it's not something that has been done a lot before. You have you have a few people in the techno world. Um, I've seen uh, the guys from Camo and Crook doing it in the drum and bass world. Uh, but there is not a lot of exploration. Not not every everyone is is, is doing this and um, because it's it's a complicated process and, and composing with it and composing not just for a, an orchestra but composing things following certain codes of the classical way of writing music um, it's like a completely different world that once you explore it um, as an artist it's it's very rewarding and you, you discover new ways of composing and um, it's uh it's it it it's like it, it opens so many doors um to everything you can do afterwards I remember it was at the same time when I was working at the Apollo Studios and I was doing more sound design um, in parallel, my music was starting to take off in the u s and I was starting to do international bookings while still having a job. And um, randomly, um, I was seeing some random videos of like my music being used in, uh, in Russia. And then uh, one day this, uh, this dance uh, TV show, um, a bit like uh, So You Think You Can Dance with Miguel, used the uh, note work for it and it blew up. Um, and then I got invited there and while I was uh, working more on like the North American front with my music um, I felt like it was really exploding uh, specifically with that song there while Gadget! I think in other parts of the world other songs were doing better uh, but specifically for Russia Notework was like the hit there but it was it was totally random I never um, I never pushed for that, it just kind of went organically. It's hard to say, I don't think my life changed drastically like in one snap. Um, things were kind of progressive and I don't know if it was because of Notwork or because of other things. Uh, Notwork became really popular in Russia and all the countries that are influenced by Russia in a way or another. So like Eastern Bloc, 
it became very popular in Australia and in in um, in the U.S. as well. Or at least it became one of my like most successful song. But so did Battle World, and so did like Black Gold, other songs. Um, so I don't think No Twerk like changed my life in some way. It definitely did in some ways. Um, but um, if it changed, if my life changed, it wasn't like like a snap. It was progressive over months and years. Um, and I and I think um, just music in general and playing shows were part of that change. It wasn't just like you wake up, no twerk is big, and and that and everything changes. It's uh, it's really just like you make music, you play shows, you travel, you meet people, and and like over the months and years, everything changes. Um, the orchestra, how many hours did it take? Uh, that many hours. Like, forever. It took forever. I, oh, I, I kind of, I took some naps here on that couch. A lot of naps. Sometimes I would listen to, like, posing for that orchestra and, and I would fall asleep and then, like, re-listen. It took forever. And, um, was it expensive? Yeah, it was fucking expensive. That, that's why it took so long to actually do it because I wanted to record an orchestra like a long time ago. It was just, just not, like I was not, I couldn't afford it. Uh, and it's only when we got um, funds, um, um, we got some help from, uh, from the government and stuff to, uh, to, to make this project come to life. And, um, and that's when we did it. I didn't. Uh, I didn't make music for uh, for video games. I was doing sound design for uh, for video games, but more specifically for uh, for trailers of Ubisoft. So we did uh, Assassin's Creed. We did Watch Dogs. We did uh, Far Cry. We worked on a bunch of stuff, but it was mainly um, uh, the trailers and it was the sound effects. So all the sounds and we, because um, like most of the music, they were using music from like pop artists like Wood Kid and stuff like that and we got the music we got the visuals and then we were making all the sound effects and bringing everything together as like a sound uh, montage um, and that was actually my my first job like I mean my first real job when um, right after university I started an internship um, at this studio called Apollo Studios and um, I came in first as an intern and I was doing like sound design writer for advertisement and uh, honestly it was like kind of the shit part of um, sound design like you know doing the footsteps in advertisement or just like um, you know when you have someone eating a subway sandwich in an ad and you have to make the sound of it you know that's the stuff I used to do uh, that was quite shitty to be honest but it was really fun because I really enjoyed um, just doing sound design and I really enjoyed being in a studio uh, rather than any kind of job. Uh, but just concretely, the kind of things that I was doing was, I mean, doing really basic stuff. It's only um, when we got contracts like Ubisoft to work on these uh, um, games, th that was like the really fun part of it. But it was only like a small portion um, of what we were doing at the Apollo Studios. And, uh, when uh, when my music career took off, I left those studios and then I did only music. Um, an interesting thing though, um, where is the second drop? So that bass line, people think it's a bass line, this shit. But this is not a bass line. This is actually the horns over-processed. Uh, it's here. Basically, this was the same trumpet sounds, horns, but just resampled in many ways with a bunch of effects. And, um, and then, yeah, again, some weird EQs and compressors and 
So yeah, so this is not a synthesizer. I just resample. So here we go. The vocals. Um, that's gonna be an interesting one. For Panther, it's pretty straightforward. Um, I sent him uh, this beat, which was basically still like very rough uh, with the taiko drums. Um, and and then he wrote the lyrics on it. Uh, he also wrote the lyrics for the girls, and uh, and I think that was done very quickly because Panther is a beast. And you send him a beat, and he's like super inspired, and he's ready to go into to jump in the studio right away. And in one take, he can do like magic like this shit here. Eyes open like they never seen a dance floor pumping like this shadow full of creatine, baby. I'm bitties all trying to shake. So um, that was pretty much for Panther. It's just like one take with um, uh, some words are in the back, like right and left here. And uh, and then some ad libs. And the ad libs are probably, wait, not even a reverb? Terrible reverb, terrible delay. Whatever. It's old shit, but it worked. Um, and then on the vocal, it's pretty straightforward, just like an EQ. Um, an old compressor. I still like that compressor. It's a really old uh, compressor, but it, it works really well. And uh, that's pretty much for Panther. Uh, for the girls, it was a different story. Uh, it was uh, a bit more complicated. Oh, all of a sudden you a bad bitch? Just got a fat ass like it's mad. So here, um, same same compressor but I added some amp, some compression, some EQ, uh, nothing on the tracks individually however um, there is actually six takes of vocals playing at the same time so and uh, all individual ones actually sounds quite bad oh all of a sudden you a bad bitch oh but like all together it sounds sick and I love the results oh all of a sudden you a bad bitch but um, I mean, um, they're, they're not like actual rappers, and this song was originally just a joke. So, um, so we just had fun. We we had some wine, and we jumped in the studio, and uh, uh, and we just managed to do that as a joke. So um, I was not expecting them to be like professional or, or anything, and um, and I love the result though. In order to have them on the rhythm, I had to cut um, cut bits and like put them into places. Uh, I remember doing yeah some warping as well so that each word would fall on the right like tempo um, and as you can see there is quite a lot of cutting um, in order to be like in rhythm and um, and yeah so that was that was it that's how it happened also yeah what is this oh yeah I did a little like little effect here that actually sounds quite cool I should do that trick again and now you're trying to shake it like sounds pretty nice so that was why is my computer freezing my computer is freezing <laughs> my computer is, is, is dead my computer is gonna explode uh, okay this is the end uh, end of the interview bye guys um, I have to buy a new computer Sorry again, my computer um, is a bit old too. Uh, not as old as this project though, but almost. Um, uh, but for the vocal parts, uh, you get the point. I did a lot of cutting and stuff, but basically the processing is pretty clean and straightforward. I feel like um, music in general is very subjective so like asking someone's opinion is pretty much just bullshit so even if it's my point of view and it, and, and you see differently like who fucking cares about my opinion so uh, don't take it personally and um, yeah don't take any advice from me either.
uh, and I will give this song uh, a four or five, maybe like a four and a half, because uh, I think it's sick. It sounds good in my speakers. It's the kind of shit I would play if I need to play really hard, because the song goes really hard. I didn't pay too much attention to the intro. I felt like the intro was really more like just something that leads to the drop. Uh, but the drop was sick and I really felt it. So that's why I gave it um, a good rating because whatever he was trying to do, it worked. All right, so um, Rock Slice, Coley Herb. Um, I don't know how much I would give you, but probably uh, around four. Um, I think your intro is really sick because it makes me vibe. Like I vibe with the flow, uh, the singer and the beat is like kind of low past, like really warm. I, I really enjoyed the, the intro. The drop, uh, kind of neurofunk like that. I used to love that kind of neurofunk, but I think I heard way too much neurofunk in my entire life. So now I'm like a bit sick of neurofunk in general, or at least when I enjoy neurofunk these days, it's more like the techie kind of stuff. So that kind of neurofunk, very like over, uh, over-processed synthesizer is a bit less my thing, uh, but I do uh, find it quite well done uh, in a way. Just uh, It's just a bit less my thing in the drop, but the intro got me really vibing. All right, Sharon Hip Hop Rhythm ID. Uh, you should find a name for your song, bro, for real, because Hip Hop Rhythm ID sounds like all my songs before I find a name, anyway. Um, I think the vibe, the hip hop vibe is really cool. I'm really vibing in the intro and the breakdown because uh, I love hip hop and the flow of the guy is quite old school but the beat is rather new school. It's a cool mix, which I like. Uh, the rhythm part in the drop is uh, very dirty, which in general I like. I think right now I, I'm not feeling it as much, but I'm sure if I had a few beers and I was at a rhythm party, I would probably enjoy it. So I would give it a four. Malorn Napalm. Um, I think this is my personal favorite of the five. 
I would also give you a four, four, five. Um, it's very clean. Uh, I like the way you produce. It's it's neat and uh, uh, in and everything fits very well and it's aggressive. It hits right in the in the place. Um, I think. Um, um, I think it's the kind of shit I would play, so uh, not to be biased, but yeah, I feel like it's really cool. Keep going. Right, ATMQ error. Um, I do vibe um, the overall feeling of the thing. I think there is a lot going on, uh, and some sound design parts are cool. Some part feels like really like Siromi kind of uh, sound design, which I've heard a bit a lot. But if that's what you're aiming for, go for it. Um, I would give it a four because I feel like it's well done uh, for that kind of genre and. Um, and I want to motivate you. Um, so uh, so yeah, I was feeling maybe a bit less the intro and breakdown, but I haven't like l deeply listened to it. Also, I feel like all these songs that I've been listening to, it's really difficult to like, you know, rate a song when you've heard it only like once. It's kind of a thing where like sometimes songs really grow on you the more you listen to it. So I can't really have enough um, um, enough time to get into it, but. Yeah, if if it helps, cool song. So we were actually before Alpha Future. I was with Adrian Villa Gomez, my friend that shot the music video, and he was filming um, some shows, some festivals, and. When we were at uh, the Ziggit Festival in Hungary, a week before uh, Alpha Future people, um, that's when I sent a message to Insta Samka. Um, and in only one week, I sent over the, the instrumental that was still kind of a rough thing I was doing on my laptop, uh, not even here. And um, she sent over the, the vocals and then just in between those two weeks, we managed to have a final version of the song. I mean, more or less final. And then um, I, w I sent it over to Instasamkas management saying like, hey, uh, we are playing Alpha Future. Are you down to just fly from Moscow to Nizhny and, uh, and maybe perform the song at Alpha Future? And perhaps we can also shoot because I, I want to do a music video in Russia. So in only one week, we like the song was recorded and then they, they were like hell yeah they flew over we performed the song live um, at Alpha Future and then uh, I, I can't remember if it was the day of the festival or the, the day after the festival um, we just uh, in, in our stories we just asked a bunch of people like hey we're shooting a music video come at noon at this place and a bunch of people showed up and we and we started shooting the music video uh, then like three, four days later, um, or not even, I, I think like two or three days after Alpha Future, we flew to Moscow and then we shot the rest of the music video in Moscow and in the surroundings of Moscow. Um, and um, everything just went really quickly. Where did I get the tank? Um, so we hired uh, Marina. Uh, she's amazing. She was uh, she was our fixer. She, she was taking care of... Um, finding things that we needed for, for the music video. And uh, we were basically just pushing like, hey, can you get this? Oh, hey, can you get that? How much is that? And like at some point we were just like, hey, can you get a tank? And she's like, yeah, no problem. I can get a tank. And she got a tank. And then we had a tank. <laughs> and what do I wish people? I think, especially for producers, it's important to kind of have a vision and believe in yourself and not listen too much to what other people have to say and kind of have fun with it. It's more important to just focus on 
you music and having fun and enjoying it as a hobby and as just a pleasure in life rather than trying to force on yourself uh, a work ethics and and be like oh i want to be big so i need to do everything in order to become big and then create frustrations or things like that it's it's more important to just have fun and like do it for the good reasons not because you want something out of it do it because you enjoy doing it and keep enjoying it and what truth help you well i knew every day since day one that what i was doing i was doing it because i liked it and uh, and every decision was based on the things that i wanted to do and um I feel like when I was doing things more for specific reasons to get bookings or to get like collaborations or things like that, it, it just never really works. You have to follow your vision, your vision. And um, yeah, that's the, over the years, I felt like if I had applied these way of working earlier, I, w I would be happier. And I kind of, that's kind of what I've done. So I can't complain too much. I love you all. Uh, thanks for everything. Thanks for watching. Um, thank you guys for the interview and see you soon.